Good afternoon, good evening and even good morning everyone. I'm Matteo Bianconi from the University of Birmingham. I'm a postdoc postdoctoral researcher in uh, extragalactic astrophysics. And today uh, we're going to see some um, interesting insights on the physical processes that in, are involved in galaxy evolution. Uh, but before uh, entering the actual talk, I would like to thank the AstroSoc uh, at the University of Birmingham for allowing us to have this nice event, sort of like bring back some normality uh, and discuss some science in this uh, rather interesting times. And so uh, as the announcement w was made to us at the university, I've uh, decided to um, take the challenge and take the first letter of the quarantine talk, so I uh, decided to pick the Q. So today I'm going to talk about, uh, as I said before, galaxy evolution and in particular quenching of galaxies to see what that means and hopefully uh, this will be of interest uh, for you in particular because it's a rather active uh, field in which Birmingham is um, producing quite some work and so hopefully you're going to enjoy. I cannot start the talk without introducing also some of the collaborators that we have here in Birmingham. As I mentioned before, I'm from the Extra Galactic Group um, at the um, School of Physics. This uh, includes also not only me, obviously, uh, two students that we have, Diana and Cressida, and also uh, Graham and Sean, leading the uh, science um, science questions that we are pursuing. Um, without further ado, I'll start with my talk. Actually, uh, a word of warning before before um, starting with the proper science. As I mentioned before, I'm from the extragalactic part of the uh, of the group, and what what that means is that the science and, and the physical processes that we'll see today are uh, involving scales and objects that are outside our own galaxy. So we'll leave our neighborhood and go in rather a rather distant part of uh, distant parts of the universe. Hence will deal with rather uh, massive quantities. What that means is, is uh, you, you'll you hear me um, talk about uh, masses of galaxies in terms of uh, solar masses, meaning that we do not count or we do not measure the uh, masses of galaxies in kilograms. It would be a rather meaningless number given that it's that big. We rather count the um, solar-like stars that each gas contains and weigh them according to this number. And so a typical number that we consider for galaxies uh, in terms of mass is about 10 to the 9, so a, a million, sorry, a billion uh, solar masses equally and, and above for bigger objects. Equally distances are rather vast and so instead of using kilometers um, we use um, parsecs which are in the 10 to the 16 kilometers. These are typical scales that we deal with when we are uh, investigating the galaxy physics um, and even multiples of these and we'll see scales of millions of kiloparsecs, so really rather vast um, scales, so bear with me uh, on that. And as an aid uh, or as the, 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 the material which will uh, Sort of try to do our investigation. We use both observations, but also numerical simulations. Observation being the first and proper um, and prototypical way of investigating astronomy, effectively taking pictures of, of the universe using different instruments in different wavebands to sample different physical processes, but also numerical simulations. Numerical simulations are effectively suits of um, um, software that uh, astronomers design to investigate uh, the um, different physical processes that we see in, in galaxy evolution, for instance. We do implement the physical laws that we believe are uh, acting uh, during galaxy evolution, and the advantage of having numerical simulation is that we can run back and forth time and time evolution, so see how uh, uh, evolution shapes galaxies. This is something that we cannot do with only observations, as those are uh, physical, um, sorry, uh, statical shots 
of an instance of the inverse. So the play between the two uh, increases the, um, the, the knowledge that we have on, on galaxies themselves. Uh, we consider galaxies for the purpose of this, of this presentation um, according to their capability of producing stars. So um, we see them as objects that are um, very uh, capable of producing, producing stars. These, these galaxies though are rather more complicated um, systems, but uh, for today we're only going to focus on the star formation side. Of, of the galaxy, but um, to show you here how important it is to have a proper set of observation, you might recognize these objects, it's the Andromeda galaxy, uh, observed in five different wavebands. You can see how different it looks, but also how similar uh, these different wavebands um, are in terms of the science and the physical processes that uh, they are highlight. In particular, if we move from left to right, we see longer wavelengths uh, associated to the cold part of uh, the gas that is contained in galaxies, gas and dust, if it's even more dense. Moving upwards in wavelengths, we see infrared, infrared being um, again re emitted by the dust that surrounds the areas where uh, stars are born. If we move further upwards to the optical uh, wavelengths, we see a prototypical image of. Of a galaxy that we might all know, this is where we see the majority of the light emitted by stars themselves. Uh, but in particular, from the older um, population of, of stars, newer stars instead can be found in the ultraviolet. So, newer stars are hotter, uh, even bigger usually, and these these um, these objects are emitting more powerfully in the ultraviolet. It's nice to see how. The ultraviolet and the infrared are um, uh, talking to each other in a way. Effectively, the, the infrared emission from dust comes from this newly born star. So we see how nice these two match. And if we move further up the scale, we see uh, X-ray. This is the, the 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 hardest part of the of the of the emission coming from uh, more evolved and rather uh, rather peculiar objects such as supernovae or uh, active black holes. But this is just to show you how different a galaxy looks like according to the wavelength, wavelength we use and also how um, star formation um, sort of like is arranged uh, in a prototypical galaxy. Uh, but we want to keep it simple so for today we just, we're just gonna see galaxy as a whole to some extent so uh, at the first in instances of the universe, we do only have uh, effectively diffused gas, hydrogen usually, in bigger or smaller clouds. If the conditions are right, this gas will begin to collapse. And as collapse uh, occur, again, if the conditions are right, we start to see uh, stars being born. And if this process um, can sustain itself for long enough, we'll eventually Again, they're simplifying uh, as this animation shows, end up with a galaxy again, a uh, spiral one in this case. And so, um, first principles are quite simple. We do have, uh, assuming that the conditions are right, gas uh, that can be found in the universe will collapse to form stars that will arrange themselves in, uh, in a galaxy. Now, you might know galaxies are not only um, spirals though, uh, as you might know. Um, so far we've seen only a spiral uh, type, but the other uh, main family of objects is uh, again classified by their morphology, so instead of being spiral, we call them spheroidals or ellipticals, given that their morphology is indeed of that shape, so more roundish and without any uh, spiral arms. So these two are the main types of galaxies that we do find in, in the universe across uh, its extent. There are plenty more, plenty uh, of objects of different sizes of, and of more peculiar also, also morphology, but for today we'll focus on these. I think uh, one of the next talk of this series, uh, of the quantum talks uh, from Sean will sh shed some lights on some 
interest in diffuse, uh, diffuse galaxies. Uh, but again, for today, we'll focus on these two main uh, objects or classes of, of galaxies. And not only these two are different by the morphology, but again, as you can see, uh, the color is different, so the spiral looks bluer, whereas the uh, spirals look uh, rather uh, reddish. This is a hint that the um, main population of stars between the two is different, so bluer and, um, means younger uh, stars, so more recently formed, whereas red um, stars mean uh, formed in in a previous time, and so suggesting that there is no no longer active star formation, so no longer stars are produced at a significant rate, as uh, or at least when we observe the galaxy, and they don't really seem these objects, so spheroids and spirals, they don't seem really um, similar by any means, but uh, we'll see in a second how. In fact, there might be a connection between, uh, between these two, there might be even some sort of um, relation in terms of uh, evolution between these two objects uh, or these two classes of, class, classes of galaxies. Uh, in particular, uh, we need to um, focus uh, for a second on how galaxies are distributed in the universe. And so, this is a panoramic view of um, the galaxy that we can see in what we call the local universe, or not too distant from us. And at the first glance, you can see here in the color map, you might argue that galaxies look rather uniformly distributed across, across the universe, but if you, if you train your eye uh, for a second, you start seeing what look like um, filaments, and filaments uh, coming together in knots that are quite, um, quite easy to spot, actually, and they're quite frequent. These knots are called uh, clusters, named after the fact that, effect, um, named after the fact they do contain a uh, lower density of galaxies. And we see this peculiar arrangement of, of objects. So on the larger scale, rather uniform, but if we zoom in a bit, we start seeing some, some peculiar structures. And we do see this, uh, this behavior also in numerical simulators. So now we start seeing this tool here in the uh, animated insets, where we see um, effectively a chunk of our universe simulated uh, with the Millennium simulation, where we see again in 3D and with a small fly line how galaxies tend to arrange along these filaments, which uh, are or can be joined together and um, ending up in this rather vast overdensities of, of um, objects that we do call clusters. And so um, there seems to be uh, this rather peculiar arrangement of, of galaxies in, in the universe. And if we, for instance, um, take a picture or an image of these objects, in this case with the Hubble Space Telescope on the right, we see something very peculiar. Um, galaxies in clusters seem to be, again, of the spheroidal type, rather massive, you might agree. Um, red, as we saw before, so the prototypical spheroidals that we, um, that we saw. Whereas a galaxy in isolation, as you can see on the left side, is spiral, maybe smaller even, and definitely different from the uh, majority of the galaxies that are um, uh, populating the cluster. Just to stress to you that the majority of the objects that you see in the cluster panel are indeed galaxies belonging to this very objects um, alone, so not background or foreground. They, these, all of these galaxies, and they could be in the thousands even, do belong to one single gravitationally bound, as we call objects. Uh, gravitationally bound meaning that, meaning that all the galaxies are sort of locked in this structure together, and it can be considered indeed as one object, not just a, a mere over density um, in projection. And, um, and indeed, um, the astronomers sort of uh, argued that maybe um, galaxies starting in isolation, looking like spirals and with active star formation, 
can be accreted as time progresses onto clusters along the filament that we saw before. And as this, um, this process occurs, the evolution of galaxy changes and some physical processes by, might kick in that lead to a transformation of what is a spiral and activist forming objects into a massive spheroidal. And being this a strong, uh, astrophysical talk, I have to put a uh, mandatory cluttered slide, so bear with me on this one. But uh, I wanted to um, sort of like shock you with a, a rather a rather dense uh, set of um, uh, set of um, names because this is effectively the most up to date um, list of uh, of physical processes that are. Uh, understood to, to act as a galaxy is in falling and accreted into a cluster. Uh, there are many, uh, they have uh, rather bizarre names, as you can see here as well, um, but typically, at least, we can agree that, the, you know, the community agrees that they can be um, divided into two categories, hydrodynamical and gravitational, according to the physical process that dominates um, these um, all, the, all these different effects. Now, um, I've left some, uh, some empty space on the bottom because this picture is uh, ever so evolving, so new theories and new um, ideas are, um, are discussed in the community on what is the dominant process that transforms galaxies uh, from active star forming objects into passive spheroidals. Um, but again, to keep it um, keep it in the spirit of simplicity, I've also um, continue with a simple animation. So we had the galaxy that we saw uh, before, again, still with preserving some gas around it, which is effectively the fuel that powers that formation. And we saw that through some process, this gas has been blown away, its spirals, well in this case, have fallen off, uh, but you get the, the, what, what I mean and its central core has increased. Now, this again doesn't mean to be a uh, very realistic um, depiction of what occurs, but sort of gives you an idea of what might be um, what might be some of the processes that do transform a galaxy from a spiral to a spiral. And so, um, see, um, stopping its ability to produce stars, some way, somehow, changing its morphology on, um, as these processes occur, and he, uh, leaving at the end, leaving at the end, um, red and dead um, galaxy. Uh, I want to focus on some of this, uh, some of these processes listed here, in particular, um, round pressure stripping. So on the category of the hydrodynamical processes, round pressure stripping might sound exotic, but it's uh, something that you do witness and you do um, experience yourself, actually. Uh, as, you drive, as you ride, for instance, on a bicycle, you do feel uh, pressure building on your face as, as you speed along through the air. This pressure is called a deep ground pressure, and it's the same that the galaxy, that a galaxy in falling into a galaxy cluster, so again, it's very massive over density. You, do, you should imagine galaxy falling in at speeds in excess of thousands of kilometers per second, so incredibly high speed. And the, the gas actually that permeates galaxy clusters acts as the air in the example of you riding through, um, through the air. And so galaxy feels this pressure building up uh, on itself and the gas that is contained within the galaxy gets stripped and removed and left in, in its wake, which we can see here in the left panel in this rather gorgeous image of this informing galaxy. You can see here extended trail of gas that's been removed from the galaxy and effectively this process removes the fuel that powers star formation equally um, here in this uh, left uh, and the right inset we can see how the stars are not affected by this process again but instead the gas that is contained within the galaxy gets removed and so the fuel uh, power star formation gets uh, gets from you removed and so this appears to be a rather um, effective uh, process um, stopping and quenching, so finally we use this word, quenching um, star formation in, uh, in infolding galaxies, infolding galaxies into clusters in particular. 
Um, another another uh, very spectacular process that we see in cluster is, or galaxies in general, but with uh, significant effects in cluster is an active galactic nucleus. This is a supermassive black hole uh, which is often located in the central regions of galaxies. We're talking again about um, black holes of even um, millions of solar masses, so really vast uh, massive objects. Um, if some of the gas within the galaxy is funneled onto this black hole, we might start seeing uh, some activity in the shape of jets, very powerful jets, as you can see here, um, being uh, shooting upwards uh, and outside of the galaxy, again, extending for sizes well beyond the galaxy itself. Uh, and impacting not only the galaxy because of uh, effectively a snowplow effect. So you can see here this jet um, clearing off the gas um, as the jet itself is moving through it, uh, but only on bigger scale here on the on the right. Again, we see in uh, in red the emission from one of these jets, and in blue the gas that caused um, rubber pressure stripping galaxy being effectively kicked out of the way by this jet and so these jets are so powerful that are um, able to influence the entire cluster environment. These clusters are scales of hundreds, thousands, thousands of the size of the galaxy themselves and yet one single massive, uh, nevertheless, um, supermassive black hole can influence uh, it, this entire environment. It's, and it's crucial again because the snowplow effect and this effective injection of energy from the black hole into the surroundings of, of galaxies kicks out, removes, heats the gas that is supposed what well, was uh, set to collapse onto the, onto the galaxy itself, and so removing again um, the fuel that powers that formation. So, as, we, as we're seeing, all of these. Uh, all of these um, if, um, processes can indeed uh, affect the ability of, of a galaxy to produce uh, stars. Um, moving again to slightly bigger scales, uh, we see here um, what is known to be a merger shock. So, if um, if, a, if a cluster is undergoing um, significant accretion of galaxies as they move through uh, the diffuse gas that permeates clusters this can cause the creation of um, a shock wave this shock wave can um, can wash over the entire extent of the cluster itself leaving this rather beautiful pattern that we see um, both in observations and the camera use and study in simulations stirring this, um, uh, the distribution of the gas and altering the overall conditions in which galaxies are located. So um, again we see that even this, uh, this merger shock passing through, through galaxies are able to stop the accretion of further gas onto, the, onto these objects and so stopping again um, star formation. Uh, interestingly, actually, in this observation, we can see um, these two cavities here that are understood to be inflated by um, a very powerful black hole that sits in the very core of the central galaxy located in the central part of this cluster. And so, again, we see effectively, uh, or we start to build a bigger picture that um, the sort of base galaxies, evolution, galaxy evolution, in particular in clusters, is not only one single uh, process dominating um, the entire uh, galaxy evolution. There could be many that could be acting on different time scales, but again, act, uh, acting together eventually and building this further complex uh, picture that we're trying to uh, disentangle. And ultimately, we see also some gravitational processes, and so we have seen the dynamical side of them, of um, what we call environmental processes. Here we see the gravitational ones, for instance. Uh, the more classical one is what is called a galaxy merger, effectively two galaxies, two galaxies colliding to one another. And if we saw hydrodynamic processes mostly affecting the distribution of gas within galaxies, 
uh, gravitation processes and the ability of uh, modifying the morphology and the structure itself of the, um, of the galaxy, and in particular then of the stellar component within, uh, within the galaxy itself. And so rearranging it and destroying, what, uh, for instance, the spiral uh, structure of a galaxy, as you can see here, and ejecting, ejecting uh, some parts of the galaxy themselves, and ultimately this uh, do, does have um, an impact on the, uh, the evolution of the galaxy itself. It might create just by adding a more massive object, but also lead to the formation of the debris, debris that uh, then will become um, smaller, smaller uh, and rather irregular galaxies. And again, as I was saying just, uh, just before, piling or compiling the entire set of uh, processes, galaxy evolution is quite complicated, but I hope I give you sort of like a, a panoramic view of what, uh, what is known and what is uh, thought to happen as galaxies are created into clusters. But um, for that purpose, also I want to show you uh, a really uh, nice uh, movie from a cosmological simulation, so again, a numerical simulation where we do insert uh, all the physics that we uh, understand to be acting on galaxy evolution, and we can actually see all these processes uh, acting at once, and so understand what is the uh, time evolution of these processes. On the left panel you will see the evolution of the stellar component of all the galaxies come together, and on the right you will see the gas component, so uh, keep an eye on both as, as the movie uh, plays. We see, uh, or we start to see the first encounters in the central uh, region of what will uh, be the core of a cluster and we see that as all these encounters are occurring gas gets ejected, heated up and we start seeing even some effectively explosions. These are um, the black holes that are located in the core of galaxies becoming active and ejecting a lot of energy in the surroundings effectively uh, washing away and pushing away the gas that is contained in this and these galaxies. We see already that the galaxies are turning red because no recent star formation is occurring, uh, because there is no uh, fresh gas that can fuel star formation uh, itself. And we start seeing already that we end up having a massive spheroidal in the central region of a cluster. And we see you know, ultimately an individual uh, merger followed by pressure stripping and also again activity from the central black hole so again all the all the processing all the processes combined at once which lead up to effectively uh, the massive um, galaxies that we see in the course of clusters and so I've um, hopefully I've sort of like wanted to give you a panorama of what's known and what is understood to happen in clusters. Plenty of questions are still open. Um, is there any difference uh, in the way galaxies are accreted or is there any difference in the evolution of galaxies according to the way galaxies are accreted, if they are accreted in isolation or in smaller groups? Do we know exactly how long it takes? Um, and well these are, I put them here as open questions because these are still being investigated. In particular, uh, Birmingham has quite some history on, on this on the subject, so actively producing research on, on this very topic, but also using clusters and galaxy evolution as a more general uh, tool for understanding the evolution of the universe, and also using um, clusters indeed as um, cosmic laboratories where we do what we can test a lot of uh, interesting physics and further involvement of Birmingham is also in upcoming uh, missions that will be um, soon uh, online in particular the Verubian Observatory, Euclid and Erosita which is actually now flying so these, um, these new instruments are um, will be very interesting to follow uh, and Birmingham will play an important role for the science done with these instruments. And I would like to thank you once again for the attention and thank you again Astro Sock and I'm open for uh, your questions. Thank you very much.